from I Am Interchange. This is the Hatch Podcast Series. It seems now more than ever that we have found ourselves on the cusp of monumental worldwide change. Whether we consider the environment, politics, infrastructure, health, economics, or inequities across a broad swath of social constructs, the consensus is clear and urgent. All is not as it should be. The United Nations, a consortium of 193 member states from around the globe, agrees. In 2015, the UN unanimously adopted the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. These goals call for urgent action and global partnership to secure peace and prosperity for people and the planet, now and into the future. In alignment with the SDGs, Hatch, a curated network of artists, activists, and entrepreneurs working together to accelerate positive global change, has partnered with IM Interchange to fuse adventure journalism with experiential design labs to develop innovative solutions to complex global challenges. Many would be surprised to realize that women only secured the right to vote in the United States a little over a century ago, and that, perhaps tellingly, they began attending institutions of higher learning in remarkable numbers at about the same time. The female presence in business is further still in its infancy, though women have outnumbered men in colleges and universities across the U.S. since the mid-90s. They remain an underrepresented minority in the workplace particularly in positions and industries synonymous with success. But why? Is the problem merely timing? Is it men? Are the patriarchal systems and structures that have defined this nation simply intent on retaining that power and intelligent in their methods of ensuring it? Or is it more complicated than that? I'm Tate Chamberlain, and here on this journey through Egypt, guided by the wisdom and the waters of the Nile, I host fellow hatchers Meredith Martyr, Catherine Carlton, and Kimberly Bryant together to share the perspectives and passions that have shaped their respective work as women in business, and their intentions for the generations of trailblazers that will follow in their footsteps. Kimberly, Catherine, Meredith, thanks for being here. This is the Hatch Podcast Series. I'm Tate Chamberlain. We're on the Nile River floating on boats about to be in Luxor at Karnak Temple. And we've been exploring with the Hatch community around the masculine and the feminine and how that translates into activism and all of our projects. And it's been a really meaningful experience. So I'm really happy to have you all here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Can you tell me what almost kept you from being here? Halloween. Halloween almost kept you. And that's and that's a good kind of representative sample of what it's like being a woman in business as well is Halloween is a very special time for my family. We dress up together. I have two children. We have a picture of us from my daughter being an infant and us dressing her up. Every single year we have a photograph of us together dressed up. And this will be the first year that we don't have that because I'm here instead. Mm. And so it was uh, a very difficult decision to put this as a priority for something I needed to do instead of that time with my kids I think for me it was just giving myself you know permission to take two weeks to not be doing stuff you know not even just work but just like tasks like not be so engulfed in work and be able to unplug a little bit for two weeks is not something I usually give myself permission to do so it was a gift I think similar to you, Kimberly, it was definitely the work obligations. Mm -hmm. I do a pretty good job of taking time off. In the weeks, I took a seven-week road trip this summer. And so there was definitely a part of me when this opportunity came up that was like, I've already had my vacation. Mm -hmm. Like, I've already taken my time. I can't can't step away from my business again. And I had to justify to myself, well, there's going to be Wi-Fi. I can bring my computer. I'll get work done here. These were all lies I told myself to get myself here. (laughs) Of course, I have not opened that laptop like more than once. 
but yeah, definitely that, that pull that we have to keep our eye on the prize. We have to keep our eye on our business. Mm-hmm. Makes it hard to say yes to, to two yeah, weeks away. Totally. What kind of toys did you have growing up? I'm laughing because <laughs> even though I've been, my career has been in technology for the last 10 plus years, I was really like really a girly girl. So like all dolls, all Barbies, all girl, everything, like massive Barbie suitcases full of dolls and clothes and all the things. So very interesting that I would end up in such a male dominated field because like I'm like the girliest girly girl ever. <laughs> That's like, good to know. For real. You were totally <laughs> in, to in like all pink the other day. Yeah. yeah. I I that was I was absolutely positively girly girl. But in, in, in ways I think it was also a conditioning, if you will. And growing up in the you know, the the end of the sixties, seventies, it just was the expectation is that my mother and family, they gave me the dolls, and then they gave my brother the cool stuff, like the racetracks and all that. Like, I wanted that hot rod racetrack. I wanted that evil Knievel car. I love racing cars. I didn't get it. He got it. And I think for me as a mother, it that's something that made me be really adamant about, like, not putting those boxes around my daughter. And so... I do love the Barbie still, though, but <laughs> I love dolls and I love to comb the hair. But I still, I think that thing about choices and giving our kids choices to be, you know, and do and experience whatever they want, whatever that is, I, I just feel that's important. Like, I, that's always been my thing as a parent. So, yeah. What are the cool things I think about growing up as a kid in the 70s and 80s? Movies like Toy Story wouldn't work if we didn't all have the same toys. Like, we all grew up with Barbie. We all, you see Evil Knievel? I know exactly what you're talking about. We all had Tinker Toys. We all had Building Block. You know, you had this kind of generic toys that everyone in the United States had. Now, I never got a Light Bright because they were 50 bucks, and that was way more money than my mom was oh, yeah, able to spend. And to this day, I still want a friggin' Light Bright. I never got one. You've got to get one. I know. But that's good. You know, it's it's good that you had, there was always something missing. But I, I think it's kind of cool that we all, at the time, watched the same TV shows. We all had the same toys. We all listened to the same top 40 music, for better or worse. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there's worse than that. But it's it's interesting that we had that shared, tighter culture than we have today. And it's And it's beautiful that we have a wider culture and more things available to people. And there are definite advantages to that. But I'm of that generation where we did kind of share those toys. Saying that, I was an only child, and I played with rocks, and I would give them names. And we I did a lot of imagination play, mostly because I didn't have anybody else to play with. So I made a Tinker Toy Man that lived in my room till I was 11 <laughs> that I talked to, that had a personality that I would put hats on, and sometimes I would, might explain a lot, but just because we all had the same toys doesn't necessarily mean we played with them the same way. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of beautiful as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I, I think I had a lot of those different toys. I resonate, you know, as you, as you're mentioning this stuff, I remember those toys. I did have a light bright. It was cool. Forgotten about that. But for me, my toys were, were books and art supplies. I was a voracious reader and I was a voracious artist, I, every medium I could find. And so when I think back to my childhood, I don't, I had dolls, and I, you know, and I would play with them. We had like Lincoln Logs, we'd build little houses. My brother was really into Legos. There was a cool creative element to that. But for me, when I think back to myself as a child, I'm painting or I'm drawing, I'm coloring or I'm reading. Awesome. What about you? What about me? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um... I didn't see that coming. (laughs) (laughs) I really like, uh, I had some toy cars. I lived, I had like a yard with a ravine and like a canal that we would go down and like cause trouble and go swimming in. And 
I had a bike. I really loved riding my bike. My dad races bicycles, and he got a speeding ticket on his bike when he was a kid. Wow. And so it just kind of has run in the family. So, yeah, I really I loved it. I know that was possible. I know, right? Speeding <laughs> ticket on his bicycle. I know that's that impressive. Cool. <laughs> it's really impressive. <laughs> it's funny you say that because it, it's not a toy, but I spent a, re- a huge amount of time with animals. Mm-hmm. I talked to my horse. Mm-hmm. I, I had a pony for a little while. My dog was my brother. He was my, my, he was my best friend. And uh, I've carried that through life, you know, a deep af- affinity with animals. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm. So we're in Egypt and we're with Hatch. Maybe just briefly talk about your experience that drew you to Egypt and your connection to Hatch. This is my first Hatch experience, but I've been hearing about Hatch for several years and sort of feeling the energy of it and being really curious about it. And so this is my first Hatch experience, my first invitation. And what I knew about it is that Hatch curates really interesting groups of people, that Hatch attracts really interesting groups of people who are passionate about creating a better world. And that that resonates with me. And the idea that I would get to travel to a country I'd never been and experience these ancient yet modern, yeah, you know, somehow these timeless ruins and temples with a group of people who shared that core common belief that we are here to create something better. We are here to serve this world in a way that elevates it was, I, I mean, I couldn't imagine a better way. You know, I, I said to a lot of people, I can't, I would never have signed up for a group tour experience, not knowing the other people in that group tour experience unless it had been curated through a filter like Hatch. And now that I'm here, it's even better than I imagined. And the group of people that are here, I I can't imagine us doing this with any other group of people. If I could go back again, I wouldn't change a single thing. I want every single person on this boat to be here because every single person has been such a gift. And the experiences we've had together from the shared lens of that there is work to be done and there is a beautiful world here for us to to remember to witness to enjoy as we as we take what what the past has to teach us and f- turn it forward i can't imagine doing egypt any other way beautiful so for me i was asked about joining this tour from yarrow founder of Hatch and I had gone on Hatch Mexico earlier in the year so at first I was I probably wouldn't normally go (laughs) on a Hatch experience because I know they can be kind of intense probably wouldn't go twice this close together but it was the draw of coming to Egypt that pulled me in and then he shared the deck which talked about you know the beginnings of feminism and he was like Kimberly as as Yaro does like this is you want to go to Egypt <laughs> and I'm like and he showed me the deck and I was like say less and it was I said automatic like yeah yeah that's that's like all about what I am about like the feminine power and it was just coming back to the motherland and this is actually my first well, I've been to Mexico. Like I live in the states, so I always say, "What?" And I love Mexico, but any further than that is the first, like, really far international place that I've been since before the pandemic. And so, I just felt like I couldn't miss this trip. Like I, I really had to be here, and so, so, so happy that I did. I'm happy you're here. Me oh, too. thank you. Too. I'm so you. happy we all said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I met Yaro through another group of people, and I was like, oh, he runs Hatch. And I thought, okay, what's Hatch? <laughs> and uh, I have kept hearing such good things about it. Yaro seemed like a, a intelligent, articulate, focused person that I wanted to get to know better. And when they said Egypt, I had been here before with my grandmother, and it really struck a chord with me. I've, I've traveled the world a lot, and I always had a special place in my soul for Egypt, and I always wanted to return. And I thought, what a fantastic opportunity to return to some place where I already have an emotive connection with a good group of people to look at it again from an adult's eyes versus somebody who just turned 18. 
Mm. and see if I'm seeing the same thing, see what I missed, see what more I could make of the narratives from a different perspective, from an adult's perspective, but also through the, the Hatch perspective as well. And it's been really beautiful. I think every person on this trip has contributed in so many profound ways. Yes. One of the beauties I see that Hatch has done is that curation of people. And the fact that he did call some of us three times to get us to come. And the fact that we did has made a really magic trip out of something that would have been nice, but not magic. Mm. It's elevated the experience by having the right people. Catherine, did you find that seeing it through a more mature lens this time, was it different or was it similar? It was, it was similar. And yet before I saw more of the big picture, now I'm beginning to oddly notice little things like, oh, I haven't seen this in another temple. Why is this different? And luckily our guide is just the best. I mean, he's he's so knowledgeable that I can pull him aside and he'll explain the significance of frogs or the significance of these little things that add on to the story, that give that story depth. Because some people aren't interested in all the little nitty-gritty. So I, I think it's great that we have him available to support our, our queries as well. Right, absolutely. We covened you all to talk about the feminine in business. And I'm curious... If there was a point in your career where that just peaked, where there was a disconnect in the masculine and feminine, is there an experience that you can take me through that just kind of pinged your mind? I don't know that I have. Well, I probably do, but I would rather not rehash them. <laughs> but, That's exactly um, what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> not for, not for Let's recording. Let's dive deep exactly. into our traumas to get right, started today. Exactly. <laughs> You know, this, this trip has been a psychological journey for a lot of us. It's really interesting that it's, there's so many triggers here. There's so much history here that it is, is triggered out. And I have a problem with the stereotypes that we've been wrestling with. And I thought yesterday was really beautiful where the women got together and created a safe space. Sometimes it's okay to be in a place where everybody's being triggered by different things when you then create a safe space to digest that. And I feel emotionally excited and exhausted after the past couple of days of real honesty, of, of really people finding the, the safety to be able to share and resolve a lot of things that we would not have done on a three-day trip. It has. It has been such a powerful... We can talk about that a little bit about our women's circle yesterday. It was such a powerful sharing... I think for me in business, I, I'm in the legal field. I went into law, and law is a very male-dominated field. You know, I am alive. I am the generation that has followed the first generation of female lawyers and judges. You know, Our first female U.S. Supreme Court justice, Sandra Day O'Connor, is still alive. Right? You know, the first, I live in Arizona. The first Arizona female Supreme Court justice, Ruth McGregor, is still alive. I in fact, when I clerked on the Arizona Supreme Court, the justice I was clerking for had just replaced her. She had just retired. She was the first first woman to be the chief justice of the Arizona Supreme Court. And so in my field, I was very aware of the fact that while there were many women whose shoulders I could stand on, that was very recent history. You know, the women who were coming and speaking at my law school, who were coming in and sharing their stories with us, were the first. They, the trailblazers were in the room, you know. And so for me in my career, I don't know that there is one specific moment that comes to me, but it was I, I entered that profession knowing that I had to prove myself in that space that the spaces I was going to go into, the law firms I was going to work for, the judges I was going to appear before or work for, had actually lived part, much of their career as lawyers without any females in their practice. They didn't have female partners in their law firm. The females were the secretaries. They were the assistants, right? They were the women getting the coffee. They were not the women arguing the cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court or the appellate courts. And so for me, there was this 
this sort of entering the lion's den of choosing that, you know, to even choose law as a profession, to choose to go to law school. Yes, there were women there. Yes, there were female professors. But we understood we were part of a first or second wave of women in an industry that was still very much, is still very much in transition. And much like tech, you know, the statistics for women staying in this profession are abysmal. Women leave the, the legal profession in droves. We have, we as female lawyers, our associations talk a lot about this. How do we keep women in the profession? Because we are losing them. We're losing them to raise families. We're losing them to do other things. We're losing them because there are certain structures in that industry that make it really, really difficult to be a woman in law. And Many of us get tired of it and think, if I could do anything, you know, I'm really smart. I went to law school. I could probably be smart at something else. <laughs> and they leave that profession. And so for me, I think the the idea that I was entering a space where I was not always going to be welcome, but where I I wanted to create a place for myself. I did not, I wanted access to these tools and these skills that, not every woman had access to, uh, and I wanted almost to reclaim them for women, right? To, we, we deserve to be lawyers too. We deserve to, to be able to, uh, to be advocates, to, to use legal processes to protect ourselves, to advance our causes, to create a better world. And it was an honor and a burden to be aware of being one of those first generations of women saying, no, I deserve to be here too. And there were a lot of men and women along the way who were upholding the patriarchal structures that are so prevalent in law and who who pushed me down, right? Who didn't want me to be there, who made me feel not welcome, who made me feel like somehow being a female was a liability. You know, there there were many meetings where I was there as an attorney with other attorneys in the room, other male attorneys in the room, and someone looked at me and said, Can you grab the coffee? Mm-hmm. Which other attorney would you like to, you know, why aren't you asking that guy, right? And so I don't know that it was one particular experience, but it has been an entire career of knowing that what I do and what I tolerate and when I speak up, I am literally paving the way for the next women who are coming behind me because it is my sincere wish that they will have an easier time than I did because I have an easier time thanks to Ruth McGregor and Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg, and so many other women who I had the privilege to meet and who are still alive, still fighting for this today. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. I hope you feel appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you know, you. That, that scarcity Absolutely. you talk about uh, has a, another negative thing that we, we just touched on yesterday, but we didn't dig into it. Someone said, wow, look at all these women and nobody's competing. And mm-hmm. all of us laughed. And because... It was so such a profound comment. We didn't even need to go there. So many times, there's a great documentary called Misrepresentation. And it talks about the fact you put 10 people in a room, eight men and two women, the two women will immediately start competing with one another. And it's a scarcity mentality. Scarcity mentality. Yeah, and we need to get over that scarcity mentality, that there doesn't need to be two chairs in the room for women. It's whatever women get in that room, we need to learn to start supporting each other and pulling out that third chair for the next woman and working together as a team. And I think all of us have experienced that woman-to-woman competition that's mm-hmm. so destructive, yeah. some so of, unnecessary. Some yeah. of the most harmful experience, I, had a, I, I dealt with a lot of male partners who behaved in ways that weren't fantastic, that were, you know, not great, maybe traumatic. But it was the the female partners who wounded me the deepest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The female partners who I thought I could trust who I thought were safe because they were a woman and they were the ones who, who I let in and trusted in a way, you know, I, I knew to have my guard up with some of the other partners, the men whose reputations preceded them, that they go through assistance, you know, they're burning through a new assistant every six months or every year or whatever. You know, those, those men had a reputation, but the women, you didn't get the warning. They were your friends. They pretended to be your friends and your mentors. And 
you're exactly right. And as I proceeded in my career and I got more successful, there was an edge of competitiveness. And at a certain point, it was like, nope, you can't get any bigger than this. You can't, exp you know, now you're threatening me. Mm -hmm. And and feeling mm -hmm. that from those women was so much more hurtful. It was it was deeply wounding in a different way because I wanted that sisterhood. I wanted that support. I, I thought they were the safe ones who were going to show me the way, who were going to help me. And in some ways they did, and in other ways they, they didn't. Some of it's subconscious as well. Just, for example, when I ran, I was mayor of my town for a while. I was elected to city council. There are five seats on council, and with those five seats, there were two people, a man and a woman, who those seats were up, and there were five individuals running for those seats. And it just so happened that that man and a woman was replaced by myself and another man. And the woman's name was Kelly, and everyone kept saying, oh, you beat Kelly. And I used to say, no, 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 I beat Andy. And they would look at me funny. And it's like, what? Like, I was running against the woman? And they would laugh because they realized that they had made that connection. And so I think there's a lot of subconscious pitting the women against each other that happens as well. That jokingly, I, I really feel like if you get angry, you lose the fight. You have to point it out with a smile and laugh sometimes. And, and just bring up, like, oh, yeah, I did feel that way, and, and kind of helping each other through. But then I founded a group uh, where we met quarterly, and it was all the elected women uh, in the Bay Area would get together and, and talk about things. And people loved the chance to get to know the other women and build those connections and get to know each other as people. And we need to lean into other supporting other women because it's – People are busy in their jobs, mm -hmm. and things happen, and, and we have to, I think, be proactive in building those relationships to keep us from competing as well. Well, yeah. and I, I think it's. Oh, I'm sorry, Kimberly. No, go ahead. Mate. I was gonna. Go I was gonna say it's so interesting. You know, the example you led with that if you put ten people in a room and eight of them are men and two of them are women, the women will compete. And the example you just gave of of the way the women were, you, you know, on a on a city council with men and women, they assumed you were taking the women's role. And yesterday, in our all-women's group, of course that wasn't there. If there had been a room of 10 women, right, if you put together 10 women in a room, I think we all understand there would not be that co same competition. And it is interesting, as we move into spaces, and 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 as the, this is not just a gendered conversation, right, as we move into spaces of what does it look like for people who identify as a woman to share space together and how important is it for us to have those spaces not just integrated spaces where there are men and women at the table but creating these spaces for us as women as people who identify as women to have that safe space together to talk about these shared experiences is so important yeah i wanted to build on what both of you said, I think that, and to me, it always comes back to patriarchy and these patriarchal structures that we all live within. So, like, I absolutely have been in the spaces where, you know, there's two or three women and everyone else is a man, especially in tech, and then we start competing with each other as opposed to helping each other. And I think that's patriarchy because that's how male pat patriarchal systems, they're, they're competitive, right? It's about the war, who's going to be, you know, everything. And I don't want to say that. Well, patriarchy's bad. <laughs> so like, let me just keep it real. And But it's really about the competition. And so we all experience that, even as women. But I have also been in spaces where there are, mostly women and that still creeps in sometimes so like i think we were blessed to have this really safe and beautiful space at the moment but sometimes even in predominantly female spaces these ills of patriarchy if you will will seep in mm -hmm. and i think of it at times and this it just really hit me this morning when i was taking a shower and i hadn't thought about this for the past two weeks but i was like the conversation we had yesterday about, and Kat, you kind of went into this. You was like, well, we shouldn't put these labels like this is a male trait and this is a female trait. And I was thinking about that. And I was like, well, right, because we all have, I've been, 
I've done it myself. Like, well, oh yeah, this is my male trait. That's the bad part. And in some of the conversations, even with Meredith, and that we had um, not just in that group, but just side traits that we were talking about when we were doing other activities, I thought about this notion that, like, yeah, I do have some what would be considered a male or dominant traits. Like, I have some of those. Like, that's how I've achieved everything that I've achieved. Like, I, I had to have some of those traits. So, like, sometimes I need to, like, hold the space. <laughs> or it's like, no, like, no, we're not going to break up. We're going to stay in this space. And that's helped me as a leader. And I often have been, what's the word? What would I say? When others, when I have stood in those traits at times as a woman, that's been demonized. Mm -hmm. And it hit me this morning. I was like, yeah, no, that's not good. Like, uh, yes, there is shadow side to both pieces of that. You know, the yin and the yang, they both have light and dark. And there's a shadow. But just because as women and leaders, when we lead into our yang energy, that shouldn't be demonized. Mm -hmm. And I, I have often seen with women in leadership, and I think in the U.S. we saw a lot of that with Hillary Clinton. Um, she has a lot of yang energy. And that's that she was demonized for that. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Like the, probably the most qualified candidate for president that we've seen in our, our lifetimes. And like she's not there. Like I've, I've never... I've never recovered from that. And I think because she had a lot of that yang and, and that was demonized because it was Hillary. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> and so I, I wonder how we, as a society, we, I don't know. I, I think that's a part of disrupting this notion that we as women can't embody our yin and our yang. And, and not be held at a higher or different standard than our male peers when they, they do the same. Because it seems like when, when our male peers lean into the yin, then we're like, oh, God, oh, like, oh, my gosh, she's so incredible. It's embodying that feminine energy. and But we don't get that when we embody the male energy. It's like oftentimes demonized. And I think... There needs to be a bit more equalization in how those traits show up on anyone, male or female, to restore the balance in how we move uh, forward. And that it was just heavy on my mind this morning, and it was just sort of like a, a realization because a part of my journey, especially now, is is learning how to balance my yang, you know, like so not lean into to hold my yang. Like I don't want to. I think at times I've been made to feel like I shouldn't have that yang energy. And this trip helped me say, like, no, that's not true. Like, no, I don't have to lean into I have to be aware of not going into the shadow piece of the yang. But that's part of me. And I wouldn't be me if I didn't have that. And I can hold both. And I can lean more into yin when I need to. And I can utilize my yang when I need to. And that should be okay. And so that's kind of what I see in, I don't know, I'm rambling. I feel like I'm rambling a bit, but it was just like a light bulb moment for me this morning. And I was like, yeah, there's something about disrupting those labels that is part of our work. You have beautifully articulated so well what researchers like uh, Windsor call the double bind. And it's why I feel so uncomfortable when we use labels that come with so much baggage like masculine, feminine, we can say, well, we're speaking about this in metaphoric terms, blah, 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 whatever. Words have power and words have baggage. And consciously or subconsciously, people don't like it when you don't match up, when there's cognitive dissonance between what we expect is female and what we expect is male. And when you start acting in a not female way or, or what have you, people have issues with that. And the double bind, a lot of research. I could do a whole separate podcast on, on really interesting scenarios where they've had audiences where actors come in and say exactly the same thing. And then they've 
looked at people's perceptions of that person, and they find really consistently that women who are really effective in power are disliked. They're considered dislikable. Mm -hmm. Women who are considered really likable, people's perception of their success as a leader is considered lower, even if they've done exactly the same thing. And that seesaw needs to be addressed. And some really, really interesting research was just done uh, during COVID of women governors. And they found that where they've been able to leap that double bind is when you've got strong mother coming in, where you can be of an effective leader if you're telling people to stay home and take care of themselves. And you, you kind of bring in a different stereotype that isn't normally uh, accessible in mm -hmm. a political leadership situation. Mm -hmm. So there's people looking at, at how we can address this better. But what tends to happen is you have this stereotype, true or not true, which is another discussion, of women being better at healing, better communicators, all this. So you end up having a think woman, think crisis uh, scenario that happens in business that leads to more women being brought in as a CEO in terms of crisis. And they call this the glass cliff. And as a result of being brought in to fix, to deal with communications, this think woman, think crisis scenario, statistically, you have more women not succeeding because they're brought in in that time of crisis, this, this glass cliff that they're set up for. And we have to start uh, addressing these and really thinking these through and thinking, how are we going to address this? And how are we not only going to help women be more successful, but as a, a, a balance, not vilify those. I, I prefer hard traits and soft traits, hard skills and soft skills, because think about it in the, in the wild. Lioness, is that a male trait? They're pretty tough. Right. They're the protectors. They're yeah. the hunters. It is not a given that certain traits, certain hard skills are necessarily assigned to men or female. Uh, capuchin monkeys, the men are bigger in the capuchin monkeys, so they carry the babies. And the women are kind of mean. They go up and hunt and defend the pack. And there are many, many instances where um, the hard skills and the soft skills aren't necessarily a gender issue. Right. And I love that also from the standpoint of, you know, learned traits versus innate traits. So, like, for me, I I absolutely have considered myself like a tiger mom or a lioness. And that's because, like, I have been a single mother. And so, like, I was everything. So I was the protector, the nurturer, the pride. I was everything. But I had to do a lot of that protecting because it was only me. But that's also how I grew up because my father was incarcerated very young at, at a very young age for me. And he wasn't in the household. It was my mom. And so my mom was all those things. And so that's how I learned to be. I didn't learn as much to be the nurturer. I, I learned to be the provider. I learned to be the protector. You know, I'm still the mom, but in a, in a very untraditional way in some ways, in terms of not just being the one that could focus on the nurturing. And I know I never wanted that for my daughter, but hey, that's where I ended up. And I have struggled with that as a mom because I, I often am so focused on being the protector with my daughter, Kai. I, I sometimes forget to be more nurturing, but I have to reprogram my mind a little bit. Like, hey, like, no, like, she's like, I'm going to move out. I'm like, no, no, you're not. You're going to stay here. Like, and that's my protection. That's, it's automatically where I go into. I'm going to protect. I'm going to protect. I'm going to protect. Because that's what I had to do. So I learned to do that thing. And I see that that shows up in business for me. Like, it absolutely does. Like, I'm the protector. I'm the builder. I'm the, then this is where we're going. And I think we need to make space to have deeper conversations, like in terms of not making how women as leaders or anyone in leaders show up an analyzation of their character. Because it's deeper than that, right? Because we're bringing these life experiences. And I think we're too quick to say, no, bad person, good person. Labels, to your point, Catherine. 
Labels can be descriptive, but they can also be prescriptive. Yes. You can start feeling yes. boxed in by these labels. And mm-hmm. uh, Mama bear, mama lion. You know, they're all these beautiful, strong female archetypes. I'm very protective in my business of my clients. Mm-hmm. And I don't think of that as male or female. I think of that as just good business. Yeah. yeah I, I agree with you, with both of you, that the, these energies, the masculine and the feminine, are in all of us. It's the yin and the yang. And, and you know, as I analogize it to the, the mind and the heart, you know, that, that the masculine energy that we all have can sort of be likened to the mind. The mind is doing things. It's planning things. It's keeping us on time. Our mind is... You know, my mind got me through the bar exam. God bless it. <laughs> you know, our minds have these beautiful functions in, in getting us to where we need to be. They're the ones that are doing the things, right? That, that can be likened to our masculine energy that we all have when we are doing something, right? In our yang, that, that's this outward expression. When we are stepping back and we are reflecting, when we're in our hearts, when we're feeling, you know, that is a more feminine expression of those energies. Now, that's not to say it's just that duality, right? There, it's not quite as black and white as you are saying as those labels, but I think thinking about it as mind and heart for me is a really beautiful way to remind myself that everyone has both of those. Everyone has a mind. Everyone has a heart. And everyone has masculine and feminine energies that they are playing with. And, and that we need both of them. Yes, they both have shadow sides. If I am just in my feminine and I am just being, I'm just receiving and being in my feminine, I'm, I'm probably not going to get paid very much this month. <laughs> Those invoices are not going to go out, right? My clients are not going to get their contracts. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to, to do the things that I want to do in the world if I am just in that feminine yin receiving space. And so I think business by its very nature is masculine. Business and commerce by its very nature is a doing in the world. I am going to do this thing. I'm going to offer this service to you. And if you want this service, you are going to, to receive it, right? You're going to pay me for it. We're going to have this exchange. But in order to provide that thing, whether you sell a product or you offer a service, you know, that is a doing. That's an outward expression into the world that is inherently sort of in this what we're calling for purposes of this conversation, sort of the masculine energy. And that is so necessary for all of us. But the question for us, and and this was the the framing for this exploration in Egypt, is how do we rebalance the feminine? How do we say, yes, my law firm has to do things. My law firm has to be on time. I have to make my appointments. You know, I have to send my invoices. I have to write these documents. I have to manage my team. How do I also incorporate the receiving? How do I incorporate the being? How do I incorporate those softer skills into what is already an inherently somewhat masculine framework of this business, of this putting something out into the world? And, and for me, that I, I see that show up in places where even in the male partners that I was mentioning, there were a lot of uh, male partners who are yellers. They get really angry. And I consider that, that they're feminine, right? That they are in this emotion space where they are, they, you know, and, and may, we can call it a shadow side because I don't actually think you should be yelling at other people at work. I think that's a, not a great thing. But, but the idea that they were so masculine, right? That people would say, oh, he's so masculine. He's, he's this boisterous, loud guy. It's like, oh, he is in his heart. His heart is all over. His heart has some big feelings about what is happening here today, which is why he is screaming at his employees right now. You know, and, and that's not to say the feminine is bad or, or all emotions are feminine, but I think so few people recognize the ways in which they, you know, again, as you were saying, Kimberly, you know, as, as women, we are often criticized when we're in a masculine expression there are so many men who are expressing versions of their feminine energy who are in their hearts, who are leading from that emotion-based place, and we don't identify that as feminine. We don't, you know, the same way they are judging us for being too masculine or being too much like a guy, mm-hmm. those guys are showing up in some ways that are definitely more expressions of soft skills. And sometimes the low, you know, in my the experience I'm using right now is a lower expression. I've also worked for incredible men who 
who were so heart centered and who were so compassionate, who were so nurturing, who really, really took the time to, to sit and be with the people who worked for them in, in a way that, that I identify as a more feminine trait, a more feminine energy. Yeah. I, you hit on something I hadn't thought of before, but I'm excited to think about it more is you've got the male female balance in the individual, but you also have the male female balance in the culture of that business. Yes. Mm-hmm. So you've got kind of the internal and the, the external. And possibly where we see more problems is where you don't have a balance between the two. And that comes down to building trust, building communication. And I think as leaders, they're part of our work, part of our obligation as leaders, as business owners, is to ask ourselves, where is that balance in me? And how do I want to show up in my business? Because you can either decide to be the taskmaster, you can be the micromanager, you can be the one who's in your masculine energy, keeping the trains running on time and sending the invoices. And if that's the case, who in your business is doing the receiving? Who in your business is in the creative space? And maybe you hire that. You know, if you're someone who that's not natural to you, you really like the organization and the doing and the being on time and all of that, you may need to pull in creatives. When you get ready to do a rebranding or you get ready to come up with a new offering, you may need to hire some creatives to come in and help you get into your feminine, right? To get into that creative, visionary, what what's going to bubble up flow space. On the flip side, if you're someone who is super creative and has lots of ideas and really loves to be slow and intentional and take your time to let things percolate, well, you need to hire some support that's going to help you with that masculine, that's going to help you manage your schedule, that's going to help you manage the team. And so I also think these energies, as we become more aware of them, can show us where our strengths are and where where we need to call in more support and what kind of support we need. You know, if you're someone who's really detail-oriented, who's really focused on those details and then you hire another person who's really focused on those details and then your next hire is just like you, you're going to create a culture in which, you know, the idea of missing a deadline feels like death, right? You're going to, you're going to create a culture where being that precise, being that rigid is the expectation in that culture, right? And, and I'm I'm not even going to make it masculine, but just, you know, that is, I think being aware of your own expressions of those different sides of your yin and your yang can really help you look at your team and say, how do I create a balanced team? It's not that I have to fix myself, right? It's not that you're good or bad for wherever your balance is. You may choose to work on it. That's, that's your choice. But if you can identify that in yourself, Hey, I'm, I'm in, I'm really in my yin a lot. I really want, you know, I work best when I have spacious days and I don't have anything on my calendar. I need to hire someone to protect my calendar for me. I need to hire someone who loves that, loves organizing the things so that they can manage and keep their eye on that ball for me to create that space for me to flow and to feel that spaciousness in my day. Are there any other ways you think, Meredith, that when we think about, I, I hate to, now that we've talked about I hate to use word, <laughs> feminine models of business or practices, are there other ways structurally we can bring those principles to play? Like, what can we do from a structural perspective? Mm -hmm. Great question. So I really think about the analogy I use is the feminine is like water, and water flows everywhere, right? If you have have water that's just out there, it's going to flow all over the place, and it's going to seep into all the cracks. And I think of the masculine energy as the container, The masculine energy is the glass that holds the water. And as you grow your feminine, as you develop your feminine and and you have more water, maybe your glass changes, right? It can change shape. It can get bigger. It can get smaller. But I I think what is so important with the structures, even the word structure to me is that masculine, right? And asking, what, what do I want to create in my business? What do I want my business to feel like? What do I want my days to feel like? And from that place, from that sort of feminine questioning of answering what you want that spaciousness or that flow or those days to feel like, what masculine supports, how can I bring my masculine in to support that? And so 
from a structural perspective, I think for me, the biggest thing has been my calendar going, you know, when I was in big law firms before I went out on my own and started my own law firm, I was expected to be in the office by eight every day. I was expected to work until the work was done, which it never was. You know, that meant I worked every weekend and every vacation. And, you know, I was constantly doing, I was constantly, my days were completely booked and with meetings and calls and all of that. And then the writing work, the drafting work that in theory, I would have had time to do during my day I had to do in the evenings, I had to do on the weekends. And so when I went out on my own and I started my own law firm, it was really important to me to rethink that calendar and to create blocks of time where I didn't have anything on the calendar. That was what I wanted more than anything, just spaciousness. And so giving yourself permission to wake up on a business day, to wake up on a Tuesday and go, you know what? I don't want to do any of the things that I had planned for myself today. I see that to-do list and I don't want to do it today. My energy is telling me to stay in bed or my energy is telling me to go for a walk or my energy is telling me to call my friend and trusting that, allowing that, because what I have seen time and time again is that that conversation with a friend, that nap literally is the thing that I needed to shift this perspective. You know, I, I thought I needed to get up and write this, this contract and I wasn't sure how I was going to draft this one section. There was a tricky part. And when I gave myself permission to not think about it, to not do it, to go and be in this other energy, that's when the light bulb, of course, goes off. I'm like, I, and I came back to it the next day going, well, I'm so happy I didn't write that yesterday. I would have written the wrong contract. I would have written it differently, you know? And so I think from a structural perspective, building flow, building spaciousness in your business, whatever that means for you, whether it's taking two weeks off to go to Egypt or building in a, I have a, a, my business coach calls hers Wednesday weekends. She takes every Wednesday off. So she works Monday, Tuesday. She doesn't work Wednesday. Then she works Thursday, Friday. And that for her has revolutionized her work life, just giving herself that permission to take that day. And so whatever it looks like for you to be in that state of, of, you know, of receiving, of just being instead of doing and being conscious about building that into your business, into your schedule, I think that that's the beginning of all of it. Thank you. What's resisting you? What's resisting this? Who's resisting this? Well, I think we touched on it a bit. I think it's, you know, society is is really, all of society, and I, I won't even just say in the U.S., is, is driven from the male lens, I, I will use gender in this in this particular case. I, I think it's driven from the male lens, and so I feel even though you know, women are the majority of human beings on this planet, we I I want to see a world for my daughter and her daughter and my granddaughters that's more balanced, right? just so there's more feminine perspective and how things work everywhere. And that's what I hope for. I don't know that I'll live to see it. You know, I I think it's generations and generations out. I I struggle when people say, oh, how do you balance family and work and this and that? And you don't. It's a flow. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just going to be more about family. Sometimes it's just going to be more about work. Sometimes, frankly, it needs to be about self-care. You ask what gets in the way? Probably me. My own pressure I put on myself because you're aware of being a female CEO, a female lawyer, you know, these these Mm -hmm. roles that we have, and we don't want to let anybody down and we don't want to let ourselves down. And I think most of the people on this trip are type A people. (laughs) <laughs> um, who are really exacting on themselves as well as anyone else. Yes. And uh, I have to sometimes, you were commenting before we started that I tend to be uh, zero or a hundred. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very common with people, male and female, that are leaders, is you've exacted some amount of uh, pressure on yourself to achieve and to get where we are. And that's why we have heart attacks and cancer and nervous breakdowns and burnout and burnout. Yep. And we have to start doing, I love the Wednesday idea. It 
part of me kind of cringed thinking, God, how do you make that work? Mm -hmm. But probably, you know, in studying how people learn, you need sleep. You're not doing anyone any favors by staying up and trying to finish all the emails till 2 a.m. because you're not going to function that well the next day. Not only in, in just your brain functioning, but you have to have sleep. That's the way your brain takes things from the short-term memory, digests it into the long-term memory, makes the connections in that foundational knowledge, the, the meta-knowledge that we need to make the inferences in the higher decision-making processes. You have to sleep. You have to go for a walk. You have to throw the ball for a dog and just mull things over. And there's so much pressure on us that any self-care is self-indulgent. How dare you take off an hour more for lunch to go for a walk? But actually, exercise is hugely helpful for people's mental health and physical health and everything else because we are systems. We don't live individually. And I think we forget that. I think sometimes we're our own worst enemy by the pressure we put on ourselves to succeed. And I wish as a culture we embraced more that self-care as a necessary part of business as well. I love that you brought up self-care because I think self-care has been weaponized in a way. Absolutely. Right? We as women were told, oh, you're burnt out because you're not doing self-care. And I see so many women who are high-achieving women going, what the heck does self-care mean? And someone says, oh, you know, you go to the spa get a pedicure, get a massage. And they go, okay, I got to, now I got to do self-care. I got to fit my pedicure into my schedule. And then I got to fit my massage into my schedule. And now, oh, now I'm failing at business and family and self-care. You know, and now it's like one more thing to add to the list of things you're not good enough at, right? And self-care has, you know, taken on a life of its own in the ether, in the, you know, social media world and and whatever. And And we're literally using it as a tool of the patriarchy to say, you're bad at this, right? You didn't do this. You didn't fit this in. For me, self-care is exactly what I was talking about before, which is checking in and asking, what do I need? If I do not, like, what would it look like to take a day to do nothing? What if you woke up tomorrow and there was nothing on your schedule and whatever was on your schedule just sat there? You just didn't do it. You didn't have a to-do list. And you spent the entire day, the whole day, doing whatever you wanted to do in that moment. If you woke up and you wanted to stay in bed, stay in bed. You want to lay in bed all day and eat ice cream and watch Netflix, stay in bed and eat ice cream and watch Netflix. That's self-care. If you wake up and you go, you know what I really want to do? I really want to organize my closet because that will bring me joy. Get up and organize your closet. You know, whatever that looks like for you, the idea that there is a right or wrong way to care for yourself and that someone outside of you knows better what you need to be cared for. No, that's not it. Self-care, and, and I think this, this goes to the feminine for me. You know, for me, being in my feminine is really trusting my intuitive knowing. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, the feminine is really connected to my intuition. And in the first decade of my law career, I got really separated from that. I stopped listening to that for a long time because I was so busy doing. I was so busy with the output, turning out the billable hours, <laughs> turning out the documents, that I stopped listening to myself. And it has been a real process in the last four years of working for myself to get quiet again and to really tune back into my own knowing, my own inner voice of what do I need and when do I need it. And I, I think that is that is the balance, right? That at the end of the day, we all know. We all know in ourselves. If you tune in, if you've been listening to this and you're thinking, well, I have a mind, I have a heart, I've never thought about it this way, right? Or maybe this isn't about gender. Maybe, maybe I'm not just a dude who's masculine or a woman who's feminine, you know, I, I have both of these things. If that's a new idea for you, good news. <laughs> You've got everything you need inside of you. And if you can get quiet and you can spend that time, and it's going to be tough in the beginning because your mind is going to tell you, how in the world could I pull off a Wednesday? What about all those people who need me? What about, you know, there are going to be a lot of fears that come up. If I take a day off, I'm, and I had to work through these, if I take a day off, I'm going to lose clients. There's going to be some client who wants to hire me, and I'm not going to be there and sitting in front of my email, and I'm going to lose that client. Well, I'm here to tell you the absolute opposite happens. 
when you tap into that, when you are in flow, when you are showing up as your most authentic, balanced self, you are going to call the clients you need to you. And after 10 years of being taught in these very masculine patriarchal law firms that every client needed a response within 24 hours and ideally within two, I started my own law firm and I will take days to respond to people. I'll read an email and think, oh, I don't know what to do about that. And I'll just walk away and I'll wait a few days. And in a few days, I know what to say about it. And I respond and I will tell you not a single client has fired me. In fact, my business is built almost entirely on referrals. When I started showing up authentically, my clients were even more committed. They were even more loyal. They feel that when you are in balance, people feel that they resonate Mm -hmm. with that and they want to work with you. They want to be part of your company. They want to hear more about it. And so this, this imbalance we've created thinking it's how we get clients or how we get money or how we get influence is actually scaring off. It's, it's pushing away so many people who would actually be called in by our more authentic, more balanced selves. So you gave me a light bulb moment again, Meredith, as you usually do, because I had a light bulb moment just now, because when you were describing this, this notion of, you know, mind versus heart, you know, I, I heard you when you said that and I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But then when you start to talk about intuition and that being a manifestation of your feminine side or your, when you're leaning into your feminine, that's when it really resonated. That's when it really hit home for me because I have always considered myself an intuitive. Like I, you know, I, I can't, I wonder what do we call it in the black Southern spiritual religious tradition, but like, yeah, I've been that thing for a long time. But as I've grown up and been in business, I've often tapped down my intuitive because when I, and I just really started to kind of reflect on this over the last year, like every, not every single one, but most of the bad decisions that I've made in terms of like who to hire, who to partner with, this, uh, who to put on my board, board, all the things. I knew it wasn't right Mm -hmm. at the moment. There was a little thing, you know, there was a little something in my, in my spirit that just kind of shifted and it wasn't off or a little thing in my stomach. Every single decision that I've had an issue with and I think back on my business life, I knew, I knew from the first conversation, but in my brain, I wanted to make it okay. I want to be like, oh, I'm going, uh, something's off here, but yeah, no, I, we'll, we'll fix this and I'll do this. and da, da. I wanted to analyze my way out of what my heart and my body and my spirit was telling me. And lately, I've been trying to unlearn that, but it's so difficult. It is. And I am really pushing. I, I think I told someone, I was like, yeah, I'm really pushing myself. I was talking to someone about this partnership and I really wanted to do it. But I was getting all these, these messages that it was, it wasn't right. It wasn't right. And I had this meeting with this person, a potential partner, and I left the meeting like so drained, that, like every, in, like I had run the dang Boston Marathon. And I was like, oh my God, what's going on? I want to partner with this person, but I just want to go home and get in the bed. And even with all of that, I still tried to make it work. Cause in my mind, I was like, no, this is the right thing to do. This is going to be good. I'm going to do it until that person pulled away and said, yeah, no, I don't think it's going to work. And even still then, I was still like, oh, what what did I do wrong? I was like, I got to, I, I immediately called my executive coach, like, can you talk to me? And my coach was, who's a man, was like, oh, yeah, you dodged, we dodged a bullet here. This is great. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, take a day or now, whatever you need, but then we'll just push on. And at that moment, I was like, yeah, I, I knew as well, but I had to wait on them to do it because I didn't want to do it. I still wanted to make it logical. And you just really helped me in this moment to see like, yeah, there is so much space for that in business. Yeah. And now I get a little <laughs> emotional. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I had an epiphany. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And, and that is what I think as mm. women leaders, as women, there are 
there are men who are intuitive too, of course. Yeah. But I know for me, it's easier for, you know, I am able to access my intuition. And one of the gifts I want to give to the people who I mentor, who I work with, who support me is encouraging and empowering them to trust that same inner knowing mm -hmm. because everyone mm -hmm. has that male, yeah. female, any gender, whatever. This is not gendered in any way. Everyone has that intuitive knowing, but yeah. we don't have very many models in the business world, in the tech world of leaders who are saying, when you're sitting around a conference room table and someone says, we shouldn't do this. And they go, well, why not? And they go, I don't know yet. I'm just telling you, I feel like we should not do this. This is a bad idea. I think we all instinctively know your boss is not going to listen to you if you're like, I can't tell you why, but I've got this feeling yeah. in my gut that says this is a bad idea. And that isn't valued, right? In, in most of our spaces, we're asked for proof. We're asked for reasons. Give me three reasons why it's a bad idea. Maybe I'll listen to you. But if we can help each other cultivate that inner knowing and listening and, and witness it and, and lift it up, presence that in each other, mm -hmm. I think we are going to end up with much more balanced, much more evolved, and much more successful business ventures. Mm -hmm. But just, I know we're wrapping up, so I'll, I'll throw out, I, I love to end things with a question rather than a mm -hmm. summary. Um, we're three women talking about balancing. Often you tend to focus on women bringing in the, the male power. We also need to make space to help the men absolutely with absolutely their intuition yeah. with some of these softer skills yeah. as well and balancing that out. Absolutely. Agree. And there is so much harm that has been done to boys and men in our world in telling them either they don't have that, they don't have that intuitive knowing that that's not accessible for them or that they are weak if they are in that, right? Much like the women are demonized for being too strong or too hard or too, you know, too masculine, mm -hmm. the boys are, the men are, are villainized for being too feminine, too soft. Yeah. My, my gut instinct tells me that most men are just as intuitive as, as women. A thousand percent. Um, their labels tell them they're not, therefore mm -hmm. they live up to that. Mm -hmm. But I think every human being can learn how to listen to their gut. And by the way, when you listen to your gut, literally you're listening to your gut. The vagus nerve is connected to your stomach from your limbic system in your brain. It is something to be listened to. And I think that it's important that we don't put any more labels on men. We enable human beings to have that balance. I couldn't agree more. And how we dress men, maybe it's for our next podcast. Okay. <laughs> nice. Um, Meredith, Catherine, Kimberly, thanks so much for being here. This is The Hatch Podcast. We're in Egypt. See you next time. As Catherine Carlton aptly states, just because we had all the same toys doesn't mean we played with them in the same way. But Carlton's words hold a weightness far greater than some passing perspective on childhood playthings. Though we may argue for equality throughout time and topic, but what we really seek is equity. The feminine is neither better nor worse than the masculine, but it is indeed different. And that difference can be seen in how we play as children, whether the two paths diverge due to psychosocial expectation and grooming, or some intrinsic cognitive or emotional differences is arguably now more than ever before, anyone's guess. As biological sex no longer accurately describes or defines gender, and we embrace a fluidity both freeing and sometimes confusing, we likewise face the opportunity to de-sex the workplace, the home, and every gender-nuanced expectation in between. They may be mere words, those words, male and female, masculine and feminine, man and woman, are gatekeepers, and they always have been. They charge us with predefined behavioral accountability. They insist on a prescribed experience. They keep the status quo in check and stand firm and immovable in the way of change. Women like Carlton, like Martyr and Bryant are challenging those notions with every glass ceiling that they break and every glass cliff that they gracefully yet firmly negotiate for themselves and those to come. A shout out to our media and production team, Jessica Byerly, Darko Sevilla, 
Kevin Hilton, Raymond Onsatagi, Sean Mackinson, and Mark Groner. A special thanks to Yara Craner, Anya Bulis, Jared Silverman, Pete Strom, Aton Shapira, and Rachel Hicks. With so much gratitude to the Hatch supporters, Steelcase, the Kaufman Foundation, the Gwydion Fund, Envision Equality, the Hatch Volunteers, Board of Directors, Hatch Guardians, and the community who help make this work and mission possible. To learn more about Hatch, visit hatchexperience.org. Building community could not happen without food. And with that, I'd like to thank Whistlepig Korean, Red Tractor Pizza, and Zocalo Coffee House. Do you have an issue that's riddled by gridlock in your community? Shoot me an email at tate at iaminterchange.org. That's tate at iaminterchange.org. Remember, share airtime and don't ruin dinner. <laughs>